In the last video, we started looking at problems from chapter 5 of Brogman's book about trying to assess or measure rates of return, yield rates, on various kinds of investments that go beyond what we've done to this point. And um, we're going to continue that in this video. We're going to look at problem 5.1.1, what you might call part B of that problem, though it's not stated that way in the book. And in fact, I've modified the problem a bit. We're going to be finding the internal rate of return, IRR, for a line of credit account. And we're going to note something that's strange that's going to happen. We're going to note, note that the internal rate of return is actually not unique in this situation, which then begs the question, when might it be unique? And what, what kinds of situations would lead to uniqueness? But that does not happen here. So we have our generic investor, Smith, who has a line of credit account. So this allows him to both make withdrawals from and payments to the account at any time that he wants. Balance may be negative, indicating that the amount that he owes to the account, so effectively he's borrowing from the account and he's got to pay it back, or positive, indicating the amount the account owes him, essentially, then he is depositing money that's going to earn interest like a savings account. Balances in the account, whether positive or negative, are set up to earn interest at a rate of I per period. The period is not specified, but you could pretend it's months, say. Let's assume the line of credit was opened at time zero and closed with a balance of zero at time two. In what you see down here, the A's are withdrawals. So Smith, Smith is taking money out of the account. So to think of that as a positive thing towards Smith. And the B's are payments, money going out from Smith, a negative payment effectively. Thus, but these are all, all have uh, non-negative signs. Thus, payment B2 made to the line of credit clears the outstanding balance to make it zero on the account. Okay, after this payment of 1.32 is made at time two, then the account is back to zero. The goal is to solve for I, this effective internal rate of return per period. And here's some extra directions. By setting up an equation of value in three ways, to be at time two, zero, at time one, and at time two, Actually, I'm going to do it at time zero first, then at time two second, and then we'll do it at time one and see that really the time one reduces to either time zero or time two. We're also going to take any note of anything strange that happens, and the strangeness, as a little hint, is related to that non-uniqueness that I talked about. Okay, so time zero is assumed to be zero, time one is one, time two is two. You've got the A's which are withdrawals, Smith is taking that money out of the account, and the B's, which are payments, Smith is putting money into the account with those things. Let's make a timeline. We've got our three times, zero, one, and two. A zero, Put that here is zero and B zero is one. So the net effect there is that Smith is putting one into the account. At time one, A one is 2.3 and B one is zero. So Smith is withdrawing 2.3 from the account. Hmm. Bet that makes the balance negative since that's a lot bigger than that. Then at time two, a1, A2 is zero. And by the way, time two is the same as time T2. And B2 is 1.32. So Smith is paying 1.32 to bring, bring the balance in the account back to zero. It's going to be handy when you've got both inflows and outflows, money going out from Smith and money going um, back to Smith, to think in terms of what you might call the net amount received, and, and uh, Brogman's book calls it C. C0 would be A0 minus B0. That would be negative 1, that's money going out from Smith to the account. C1 would be A1 minus B1, that would be 2.3 minus 0 is 2.3, that's positive, that's money coming back to Smith. C2 would be A2 minus B2, 0 minus 1.32 is negative 1.32.
Again, that would be money going first from Smith to the account to make the balance zero. All right, so starting with uh, part one here, set up an equation of value at time zero. That means we need to discount back to time zero. And we will let uh, V equal one over one plus I. That will be our present value discount factor. So the equation of value would be taking the C's, looking at the C's and taking signs into account. Negative one, that's the value of C zero at time zero. It's already at time zero, doesn't need to be discounted. Then we have a plus 2.3 right there that needs to be discounted back in time by one period. So it gets multiplied by V. And then we have a minus 1.32 needs to go back two periods, so it gets multiplied by v squared. This is part one. Set that equal to zero, okay? We saw in the last video that we could think of it two ways. We could either think of the present values of the outgoing money and the present values of the incoming money as being the same at the given internal rate of return, or we could rearrange and get zero on one side and think of negative amounts that go out and positive amounts that come in and set the uh, some of those present values equal to zero, some of which are negative. In the last video, we got a cubic equation. We needed technology to solve it. Uh, we needed the financial functions on the calculator in particular to solve it. In this video, we, we have a quadratic. We could use the quadratic formula. We still will use our technology and confirm things, but let's use the quadratic formula uh, to solve for v here. Um, so let's see, it would be... Um, negative of the coefficient of the first power, negative 2.3, plus or minus the square root of 2.3 squared, minus 4 times negative 1.32 times negative 1. It's probably faster to use the financial functions, but it's worth reviewing the quadratic formula as well. All divided that by 2 times negative 1.32. Okay, if you don't remember the quadratic formula, you should review that. That's something you should know as an actuary. All right, let's use the technology to help us finish this. So let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and do the 2 times negative 1.32. That would be negative 2.64. Uh, and negative 2.3 divided by that would be a positive number. So let's take the reciprocal of this times 2.3. So we get 0 0.8712. Evidently, maybe with the 1, 2 repeating, I'll just go ahead and assume it repeats. Plus or minus. Let's do the thing under the square root here. 2.3 squared. Uh, we've got, <coughs> excuse me, 3 minuses is going to make a minus. <coughs> Can't seem to avoid coughing recently. What was that? 5.29. 4 times 1.32 is 5.28. Uh, the plus or minus is going to make, for this term, the minus sign down there irrelevant. We can just divide this by 2.64. We're going to get a square root of 0 0.01 here, which will be 0 0.1. So 0 0.8712 repeating, plus or minus uh, 0.1, divide by 2.64 uh, 2 is 0.1. 0.3787, and evidently the 87 repeats. <clears throat> and right away, then we see non uniqueness It seems like maybe there are two answers. Interesting. I mean, we, we should have been able to predict that, actually. I mean, we have a quadratic. We got, we're going to have two roots. They could be even complex roots, but in general, they're gonna, they might be two real roots, as they are here. Two different answers. Now, which one makes sense? Maybe they both make sense. Well, let's go ahead and simplify. I took the plus one here. I'll add 0 0.87, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Looks like one possible answer is 0 0.90 repeating. And then 0 0.87, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, minus 0 0.0378787877. Looks like it's probably 0.8. 8 with the 3 repeating as the two possible values of V, which would generate two possible values of J, or excuse me, I. Um, let's go ahead and find that. 
the corresponding values of i. So v is 1 over 1 plus i. So if I take 1 over these things, I guess I'd, if I round, I'd have a 1 instead of a 0. Take 1 over that and subtract 1. It looks like the corresponding values of i there for this one is going to be 0 0.1. And for the other one, looks like it's going to be 0 0.2. 10% and 20% look like they are two possible answers for the internal rate of return. All right, hang with me here. I think it's worth sticking this through to the end, even though you might feel like we should be done, because I'm going to make some other comments that would be worthwhile. We'll also look at, at the graph of these functions here. Uh, at time 2, then we do this in terms of 1 plus i. Effectively, we just multiply everything by 1 plus i squared, because we're promoting in time accumulating to time 2. Um, the negative 1 gets promoted by 2 periods. The 2.3 gets promoted by 1 period. And the minus 1.32 stays where it is. There we have a quadratic equation in 1 plus i which I could expand out to get a quadratic equation in i, but it's going to be simpler to use the quadratic formula for this in terms of 1 plus i. So 1 plus i is going to be negative 2.3 plus or minus the square root of 2.3 squared minus 4 times, on, once again, negative 1 times negative 1.32. The thing under the square root is going to be the same as before, and this thing's the same as before. What's different is down on the bottom, it's not 2 times negative 1.32, it's 2 times negative 1. Uh, looks like i then is going to be negative 2.3 plus or minus 0.1 over negative 2, then minus 1. That'll be um, negative 2.3 divided by negative 2, that will be what, 1.15 plus or minus uh, 0.1 divided by negative 2 would be uh, negative 0 0.05. And again, the negative sign doesn't matter with the second one because of the plus or minus there. Minus 1, giving us our two possible answers again, 0.1 and 0.2. Right, 1.15 minus 0 0.05 is 1.1, minus 1 is 0.1. And then 1.15 plus 0 0.05 is 1.2, minus 1 is 0.2. So we got our two possible answers there. Same answers, good to see that. With the second one, if we wanted to think of it in terms of an equation of value at time 1, we could think of it either in terms of i or v, or both, I guess, is the best way to do it. The negative 1 at time 0 needs to go forward in time by 1 period. It gets multiplied by 1 plus i. The positive 2.3 stays at the present time, time 1. And then the negative 1.32 needs to get discounted back by one period. It gets multiplied by v. Set that equal to 0. But uh, I don't want to use the quadratic formula on this as is. I need to either, either convert it to that or to this. Okay, So I'd either need to multiply everything by 1 plus i or divide everything by 1 plus i multiply everything by v, and I would get this or this, and I'd get the same answer as before. Okay, But it does generate the same answers. So we have non-uniqueness here, and again, it's a quadratic, so that maybe shouldn't be surprising. Let me quickly graph what's going on here, and then we'll think about this in one more way that will be helpful. Um, so I did plug in the function. I plugged it in this form here into my graphing calculator. So I have negative 1 plus x squared, representing this term, and then plus 2.3 times 1 plus x, and then minus 1.32, a quadratic in x that would have a negative coefficient for its x squared term, and therefore would be a graph that's a parabola opening downward. And if you pick a good window, here's a pretty good window to pick the graph can be seen, and there it is, and you can see you've got the two roots at 0.1 and 0.2. The window goes from 0 to 0.3. Those are at 0.1 and 0.2 for i. You've got these two different internal rates of return. 
All right, what, let's think about it one more way here. Um, think about it this way. When you first open the account, uh, you effectively make a deposit of, uh, a deposit of one. Um, think of that as an amount of minus one as far as you're concerned. Think of that as growing by either 10%, so multiply it by 1.1, or growing by 20% with sine as is, so it either grows to, so to speak, negative 1.1 or negative 1.2. Then you make the uh, withdrawal of 2.3. Uh, that's positive to you. Effectively, now in both cases, you are now adding 2.3 to this. Negative 1 plus 2.1 plus 2.3 will be positive 1.2. Negative 1.2 plus 2.3 will be positive 1.1. Now you've got a balance that's positive, meaning you really owe money. Um, and then think of those amounts growing by either the 10% or the 20%. Multiply this by 1.1, multiply this by 1.2, and you have to get the same thing. And in either case, you can check, you get the 1.32. 1 1.2 times 1.1 is 1.32. And then you subtract 1.32, meaning you're paying it off to get the balance to zero. If you think about it that way, both internal rates of return seem right as well. So this is a bit strange internal rate of return can be non-unique. And boy, what does that mean? Well, maybe what it means is this is not necessarily the best tool to use in all situations to decide what kind of yield rate you're getting. Almost forgot that I wanted to confirm the internal rate of return, or at least one of them with the calculator, financial functions. So like I showed you last time, we want to go to the cash flow uh, spreadsheet, so to speak. CF button here. Uh, clear it out, so do second. Clear work. And now let's look at what we've got here. We've got negative one is C0. So I'll put that in there as negative one and enter. And then uh, tab down. C1 is 2.3, positive, enter. Its frequency is one. Leave that as is. C2 is negative 1.32. Enter that. Its frequency is also 1. Leave that as is. Now compute internal rate of return. Will it calculate just one of them or both of them? IRR, CPT. It computes just one of them, evidently 10%. Yeah, these arrows don't change it. The other one, that's a possibility, is 20%. And like I hinted at, this isn't necessarily then the best way to measure your rate of return in some situations. We will be seeing later in Chapter 5 that there are other methods uh, for trying to measure rate of return when IRR is either not unique or is even maybe a complex number.